Hello and welcome along. My name's Chris Weird and welcome to our three times a week talk show. This is United Kingdom Talk, the main website for the show if you ever want to look at uh, any of the old ones or refer to anything or check up on a couple of pictures or anything like that. Um, the main website for the show is United Kingdom Talk. .co.uk, unitedkingdomtalk.co.uk. If you're new, if you've never been here before, a special welcome to you from myself and my gorgeous cat, Katie. We're in the garden today. <laughs> if you're watching the show uh, on YouTube or any of the other video things, uh, you will notice that once again we are in this beautiful, we are in the middle of a beautiful summer. We really are, and today, I know I'm quite famous for my colourful shirts, but today I have done away with the shirt and I am wearing a white muscle Lonsdale top. Yes, boys and girls, I'm, I'm looking quite fit today, I have to say, very fit. In fact, last night, um, I had to go over to Hemel Hempstead last night. Uh, my friend uh, Justin runs a pub over there and he's got a, a, CG, a, a, a CD duplicating machine. And I've had to run off some of my DJ mixes as demos uh, for uh, the place I work in Birmingham. On, on Friday nights, I DJ at a place called Route 2 in Birmingham. And it's a bit of a slow start. We haven't been there too long. And uh, what's happened is, is we've got a very good manager, or they've got a very good manager in there now. His name's Lee. But unfortunately, over the last few years, the place has been let to go so to speak, and um, it's not got a very good reputation. So really we're, we're kind, of, kind of starting at the bottom. Oh, there's a butterfly going past me. We're starting at the bottom and trying to bring it up again. And it is quite a long process. And uh, one of the things I thought might be a good idea of doing is on a busy night, which Monday is their busiest night there. They have a, a cheap drinks promotion there on a Monday night. I'm not there Monday, but nevertheless, um, I had the idea of if I make a load of uh, CDs, you know, DJ mix demo CDs, and they could give those out on Monday, advertising the Friday night. Do you see what I mean? So hopefully people will hear that music, oh, this is quite good, I hope. <laughs> they, they might hate it. They, they all hate me. They all hate me except my cat. Do you hate me, Katie? Katie? Hello? Katie, are you going to speak for people? Say something. Oh, she woke me up. I'm trying to get her to meow for you. Say something. Oh, well, she's not going to talk today. Oh, well. There she is, sitting down on my lap. <laughs> we love it. What other radio shows can you have cats in your studio sitting on your lap, eh? Anyway, so the whole idea is I, I made these CDs and they'll give them out on Monday on their busiest night. Hopefully people will hear them, like what they hear, and then come on Friday. It may not work, but it's worth a go. It's actually relatively cheap to do something like that because you can buy a hundred blank CDs for uh, less than £10, just a little bit under £10. So to actually do something like that is relatively cheap. I mean, I remember buying my first, who, remember, who remembers buying their first recordable CD? Anyone? I do. The very first recordable CD I bought was £9.95 for one CD. <clears throat> Unbelievable, isn't it? Now, you can buy a hundred for £9.99. Do you know what? I can feel a sneeze. And it's best, let, if I get this out of the way now, and the cat will jump. <coughs> Look at that. And the cat is still on my lap. She's not phased at all by anything I do. Completely like, unlike the other one. I had another cat um, for about over 20 years up to January, and she died in January. The slightest bit of noise, and she'd be off. She'd run a mile. This one, well, this one is the same if it's noises outside, but anything to do with me, any noises I make, whether it be a sneeze or a cough, even when I get the lawnmower or hoover out, she will just sit and watch me. She's not, you're not phased by anything, are you? Hey? Eh? Funny cat. So that's what I did last night. I went up to um, uh, uh, copy those CDs. It uh, doesn't take too long. It takes about... On his duplicating machine, it takes about about seven minutes to copy seven CDs. 
So you literally have to sit there and, and just keep throwing them out. But as I say, they're demo CDs um, to hopefully advertise the month, the the, uh, the Friday nights, and fingers crossed that will work. Right, um, I think I've lost, do you know, I think I've lost a pair of sunglasses, and I know how I did it, and I've done this before so many times. Fortunately, I found, I mean, I've got a pair in the car, but I tend to leave those in the car, because if you don't leave them in the car, then you'll go out, I can guarantee you, oh, where's the, oh, I've left them at home. You know what I mean? Oh, it's just so annoying, that. And I think, I, I did have two, uh, off goes the cat, and she leaves fur all over my lovely black shorts. Oh, <gasps> should never wear black, should you? When you've got pet fur everywhere. Look, it's everywhere, pet fur. She's gone, to, she's gone to hide under the table now where it's a bit more shaded. Um, yeah, I had two old pairs of sunglasses in the kitchen. And I've got the second pair with me today. Um, the pair I've worn over the last few shows out here, I took them out the other day, right? And I think I've lost them. And I know how I lost them, because what happens, you know, you, you, so you're walking around outside with your sunglasses off, on rather and then you go into a shop or a supermarket or something like that and then you kind of fold them over rather than you know spend the extra three seconds getting the case out of the bag and putting them in the case and putting them in the bag you kind of just hook them over the top of your t-shirt don't you and i think that's how i've lost them i've, I've lost several pairs like that and it's stupid really they're not over expensive ones i don't believe in paying you know 200 pounds or whatever they are for those designer sunglasses ray sun or whatever i don't know what they're called ray sun is it ray ban that's it ray ban i mean they're very expensive very very expensive those things i don't believe in paying that these are actually prescription ones so they've got slight um lenses a little bit like my i've got some glasses for driving so a little bit like that and uh, these two have lenses in them so not over expensive but nevertheless i do hate to lose things don't you does annoy me, I don't, losing things. We don't like to lose things. It costs money, you know. It does, so I think I've lost a pair. I shall have another good look um, in the kitchen later on. But I think they've gone. Uh, talking of kitchen, I actually cleaned the kitchen the other day. I can't believe it. Not only the worktops, well, most of them. Well, I did the one in the middle. You know, that's the big one where the food gets cut off, cut up and what have you. And not only that, I washed the kitchen floor. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I know, ladies, you're supposed to do it every day or three times a week. My, I'll be honest, my kitchen floor is lucky to get washed once a month. Please don't think I live in dirt or squalor. Send Red Cross parcels now, please. <laughs> but I just don't have the, I don't have the inclination. I, I'm not going to lie. I do have the time to do these things. Okay, I, I do. I will not lie to you, my darlings. All right. But oh, I don't know. I, I can't can't be bothered. Now, has a fly landed on me there? Just a minute. I'm sure it is. Can I just check something? I think I've, have I forgotten something? No, I haven't. I always forget. Think that I've forgotten to turn my um, sound recording device on. Uh, what else has been happening? Oh, here in Bracknell, we had the Bracknell Big Day Out, which was quite good. I, I wasn't there for very long. Um, and what it is, is there's, there's a park very, very close by, within five minutes' walk from here, South Hill Park. And once a year, they have this, uh, or we have this event called the Bracknell Big Day Out. And they have a big stage there. Yeah? And some little stalls of people selling things and, you know, the sort of thing. They have a, a beer, a place where you can buy booze and what have you, and soft drinks and, and hot dogs and beef burgers. And it's, it's all very pleasant. And I did pop over there uh, to see the team <clears throat> at a, a community radio station, which we have now in Bracknell, uh, which is kind enough to take this show, uh, Radio Bracknell. Can I just blow my... I've, I've, I hope I haven't got swine flu. Oh, dear me, blowing my nose today, aren't I? Yeah, so I popped over to see them and um, had a little walk around. But it was so hot. That was, was that last Saturday or the sat Saturday before last, I think it was. It was so hot and such a beautiful day. And oh my God, I couldn't stay too long because it was just too much. There were hundreds and hundreds of fit lads with their tops off half naked and I couldn't stand it anymore it was too much 
it was too much for this poor young man you you hear sitting here before you today chatting away all these fit lads walking around with no tops off and not one of them for me I mean, it sh you would think that one of them might show a slight interest, and there they were with their girlfriends, munching away on beef burgers and pints of lager, and they've not one of them come up and talked to me. Most disappointing. So that was quite nice, Bracknell Day Out. And uh, it was all free. I don't know where the money for these things comes from. I suppose the council um, pay for that. I didn't see anyone walking around with a donation bucket or anything like that. Perhaps they were there. I'm always a bit suspicious of that, though. People walking around uh, from charities with donation buckets and, and what have you. I'm sure, I'm sure the majority, the vast majority of them are kosher. You know, and, and, and all the money goes to the charity. But there must be one or two who've got their dip in their hand in the bucket. And that kind of stops me giving to charities. Which is a bit wrong, really, isn't it? So that was the Bracknell big day out. All right. Um, what else has happened? Um, i tell you what, I think I'm going to go on to the emails now. I've got other stuff to talk to you about today. But um, we're trying to keep on top of the emails, OK? Uh, if you want to join in, my email address is chris at unitedkingdomtalk.co.uk. Please feel free to join in at any time. Chris at unitedkingdomtalk. Dot co dot uk. Right, off we go then. Strange um, email here from Kim. Hello, Kim. Who asks, Hi, Chris. How many euros for a pizza? How might I best go forward? Would you consider giving me a couple of pointers? I really appreciate your help. Yours truly, Kim. Um, Kim, I don't quite understand what you're saying here my darling it's a bit of a random email Kim um, I'm just trying to think did we talk about pizzas in a previous show or something because I'm not sure how many euros for a pizza well um, <clears throat> here in the UK I did go to Pizza Hut a couple of weeks ago with my friend Justin who came over and it cost us about £10 each for one of those medium pizzas. So that is um, 10, about, how many, how many euros is it? Is one euro 80 pence? Oh, I don't know now. Um, I've no idea. I've no idea. We don't, I don't do euros, I'm afraid. This is the United Kingdom, dear. We do sterling here, pounds and pence. There's none of those silly little euros in this country, I'm pleased to announce. Oh, they keep trying to get us to have them, but we say no. We don't want these nasty little pretend currency called the euro. I mean, you might as well have Monopoly money, to be honest. Awful looking coins, dear, dreadful. We are not in Europe. This is the United Kingdom where we have pounds and pence. So I can't help you, Kim, but I can tell you a pizza, you can, you can get a nice pizza here in the UK for about six or seven pounds. All right? Oh, hang on a minute. Are you talking about because I said I was going to take Suko out for a pizza? Is that what you're saying? OK, well, if I take Suko... Oh, I don't want to tell you the price, because then Suko will know how much I've spent on her. And that wouldn't be nice, would it? I mean, hopefully, no more than five or six pounds for four of us. <laughs> but a pizza, you can probably get a pizza here in the UK for about six or seven pounds, and, you know, for a smaller one, and, and they would get dearer as, as the size goes up. All right, Kim? So whatever that is in euros, I've no idea, dear. I don't do euros. Only when, when I'm forced to go to another country and use such un... I don't know, undistinguishing currencies. Dear me, euros here in the UK? Please, where will it all end? My word. Talking of um, uh, Europe and that, uh, at last, some idiot, um, or no, not some idiot, uh, incorrect, some very clever know-all person, some very clever person has decided 
that in supermarkets we can once again sell vegetables that aren't perfect. You're probably thinking, oh, what's he going on about now? Well, um, you must notice, certainly here in the UK, I don't know where you are, I would imagine it's, it's similar in, in many countries, but when you go in a supermarket and you look at the fruit and the veg, everything is virtually looking the same, isn't it? The tomatoes are the same size, the carrots are the same size, everything, the kiwi fruits, all the same size. Everything looks the same. This is because the European Union has said for years that we can't sell anything that has imperfections. Like, you know if you get a potato and there might be a bit extra growing off it, we wouldn't be allowed to sell that. Biggest load of rubbish you've ever heard. I mean, how much of this stuff is wasted because it doesn't look right? That's a terrible, terrible waste of food, isn't it? When do you think of all those people starving? I mean, I don't know, do they send it elsewhere? I just think that is such a terrible waste of food. Anyway, uh, I was watching the news last night and they changed the rules so that supermarkets can now, once again, sell food that looks imperfect. So I'm, I'm very pleased about that. Very pleased about that. And of course, you know, we haven't all got loads and loads of money and what have you. So what a good way for the supermarkets perhaps to bring in um, a cheaper range perhaps. You know, if you're not too bothered about a carrot that isn't quite straight or a cucumber that bends round a bit, if you're not too worried about that, perhaps the supermarkets can sell that cheaper. But it's just awful that they haven't been allowed for years and years to sell fruit and veg that doesn't look right, don't you think? There was one bloke on there, I did make a couple of notes, and I, I can't find them at the moment. Really. Have I got this here? No, I haven't, I haven't got my notes. Um, I'll, I'll try and do it from memory. There was one farmer there who grew kiwi fruits. And he was saying they were rejected because they were slightly underweight. Now, for him, you know, if they're slightly underweight, he would have sold them cheaper. But he's not allowed to do it. In fact, he wasn't. He said on this news news interview, he said he wasn't even allowed to give them away. He has to chuck them. What a dreadful, dreadful waste of good food just because it's not the right weight and shape. And it's, I mean, some of the rules that the EEC come out with are diabolical. That's that's why I'm so against it. I mean, some of the rules are good. Some of them are good. They come out with the occasional good bit of news, but I think most of it is, is a load of, load of uh, mismash. So thank God someone's got their head on and they've decided that because it's, it's, it's just a terrible thing to us. I mean, years ago, I think in the 70s, we had these great butter mountains and wine lakes where, where uh, wine was held back to increase in value. I mean, it's the most ridiculous thing. When you've got countries that are storing massive amounts of food and other countries in the world that are starving to death. I often see these programs of people in um, certain countries, a lot of the African countries, whose entire day is spent looking for food. Can you imagine that? I mean, nothing Nothing like that, what I'm about to say to you, but I actually went to the supermarket late on Sunday. I don't usually go on a Sunday. It's the worst day of the week. The customers are aggressive. <laughs> the staff don't want to know. But nevertheless, I had to go out and get a few bits and pieces. I think I'd run out of some, a few bits. And I went to the fruit and veg section, and there were certain items that they'd run out of. Uh, strawberries. Can you believe they run out of strawberries? Now, usually, they've got hundreds and hundreds of strawberries there. Oh, can you hear that? That's a text message coming in there. Oh, text message coming in on my, on my new phone, incidentally. I've got a new phone, but uh, I'm not going to have time to tell you about that today. Let's have a quick look who that is. Oh, oh it's someone wanting a phone call. Oh, he's going to have to wait, I'm afraid. I can't be talking to people yet. God's sake. What do they think this is? Ring me now, it says. Can't they ring me? 
Besides, I can't take a call now, not while I'm talking to you. Anyway, so I went up there, and there were no strawberries, and there was no... What else? There were a few things that they'd run out of. And to me, I'm like, oh my God, I can't get any strawberries. I can't believe it. It's just a minor thing. Now, let's have a little think about that. What would it be like to go up on your usual shopping day, right, and you get to the supermarket and there's nothing in there? Just think about that for a moment. What would you do? There's nothing you could do, is there? My guess is the majority of people would not be able to, oh well, I'll go back home, go into the garden, pick something. There's nothing. Walk into the supermarket, nothing. This is how it is for some people, for many, many people in the world. Forget walking up to the supermarket, there aren't any. They have nothing. And it's so scandalous for certain countries to have a glut of food, <clears throat> literally going rotten. Some of it must go rotten. I can't believe that all the extra food that's made goes out to be, why can't they just give it away? Oh, that's, that's not how it works. Oh, you'd upset the system or something like this. You know, you'd upset the system or someone would be losing money. Surely it's better to give it away for nothing than have it rotting in a great big pile somewhere. How stupid is that? And yet it's been going on for years. It's so, so mad that I went up there and, oh my God, there's no strawberries. You know, and that started worrying me. What else haven't they got, I thought. But sure enough, you know, all the shelves were stacked full of other stuff. What if they weren't stacked full of anything? What on earth would you do? Your thoughts on that, please, Chris at unitedkingdomtalk.co.uk. Chris at unitedkingdomtalk.co.uk. This is where the, you know, I was talking about charities a minute ago. I do not like giving money to charities. It has nothing to do with being tight. The amount of it, often that goes in administration, is unbelievable. I'm quite happy at local church dues when they have sometimes um, collections of food. And we used to do it at the Scouts as well. There'd be a couple of days of the year, uh, one was around Christmas time, where you'd be asked to bring in items of food, non-perishable items of food, like in tins, which could be distributed to elderly people with not much money. And I used to do that. Yeah, I've got no problem with, with dishing out food. But I don't like so much to give money to charity because, because so much of it goes in administration and I, I just feel all along the line people have got their hand in the bucket and all that, you know? I mean, perhaps that's the, the completely the wrong way to think about it. I'm sure there are charities who are not like that and where every penny goes to the cause concerned. Uh, such as, for example, I do believe the BBC's Children in Need appeal. I do believe that is one of those where every penny they collect goes to the charity Children in Need, the charity concerned. And there's often been articles in the newspapers about how much Terry Wogan gets paid and this, that and the other to front that show. Well, that's neither here nor there. He is not paid out of the charity money, he is paid by the BBC from the licence payers' money. Completely different thing altogether. OK, that's, that's, that's another subject. Whether you agree or not with that, that's up to you. OK, but he's not paid from the money that you give to children in need. That all goes, I'm, I'm sure I'm right there, that all goes to the charity. But there are other charities, and you've only got to look at their accounts and see how much of it goes in administration. There are many people running charities who are on an awful lot of money. The charities concerned would say to you, ah yes, but we've got to pay that amount to someone, otherwise we won't get them to do the job. I, I can understand that, but surely, 
surely there are people out there who would do that job for a lot less than what some of these directors of charities get. Of course, once again, the charities could come back and say to you, well, yeah, but they wouldn't know what they were doing and people can learn. I, I, and that's why I, I rarely, rarely give money to charities. Nothing to do with being tight or anything. I do have um, one... I do have one um, direct debit to a certain charity. I won't say who or how much, but I, I do have a direct debit to go to them. But generally, um, the buckets, I don't like putting into buckets at all, because I, I just don't... You just don't know, do you? Your thoughts on that, please, Chris. Lots to think about today. Lots to write in about this week, isn't there? Chris at unitedkingdomtalk.co.uk. Chris at unitedkingdomtalk.co.uk. Right, uh, let's go over to sunny Spain. Hola, Christopher. Hola to you. And this is from Maureen, who's in Spain. She says, you may not remember me. I wrote to you once from Benidorm last November when my husband was in hospital. They're having a heart operation and I wrote telling you how your show helped me through what were very dark days. You have the gift. I'm not sure what the gift is, but it works. I'm not sure what it is either. I have been told actually by a few people I have a gift, but that is really not for this family show. <laughs> Pulling your leg, Maureen. She says, "The good, of course, I remember you, Maureen. You don't think oh, you, th you don't think I wouldn't remember something about someone being ill, would you? Oh, I, I remember um, certainly emails about illness, and uh, we've also had a few over the years now of of people who've who've um, died. <laughs> Obviously, not people who have died that have written in, because they haven't found a way of doing that yet, have they? Wouldn't it be great, eh? Uh, I know." And I don't take, I don't say this lightly at all. I know there are many people watching the show now who have lost a, a relative or a pet or something like that. And it's, it's so hard. Wouldn't it be fantastic, right, if they could write an email, if you could write an email or something once you were dead to tell us you were all right. How, wouldn't that be great, eh? Oh, how I'd love to be sitting there perhaps, on my computer. And suddenly I get an email in and said, this is from your mother in heaven. And she'd tell us how... Wouldn't it be great, eh? <laughs> of course I remember you, Maureen. Um, Maureen says, The good news is that my husband is fully recovering and we are now able to resume our lives here in Spain. Beautiful. Oh, well, we're off to sunny Spain. El via España. She says, But the difference is that we no longer take our health and lives for granted. And now, no day is boring. We make sure of that. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I don't get bored at all. I've always got something to do, Maureen. Always got something to do. You know, even... I know some people wouldn't class watching the telly as something to do, but I watch so little of it that that's kind of a... I don't know. It, it, it's, it's not part of my day. I watch the television when I can, and it is nice to actually sit down and watch a bit of telly. Although I do find it very hard to sit down and watch an entire program in one go or film. I'm always doing other things. I think one of the mistakes I made in the living room was um, when I changed computers up in, in the studio, the, the main computer, I moved the old one into the living room. And often while I'm on watching the television, I turn that on as well. And I'm typing away on there, doing that and watching the telly at the same time. And you miss stuff because you're not concentrating on the telly, you know. She says, I must admit to you that I've become addicted to your programme. Yes, I'm like a drug. I am, I am a new, I am a new, um, uh, Chris Reardon, me, I am a new illegal drug. And there have been... Um, cases of people being taken to court and placed into prison because people have been um, dealing United Kingdom talk on the streets. Oh, I've seen it happening. Yes, I have absolutely... I've seen it happening in King's Cross here in London. 
And that, that obviously, they hadn't recognised me while I've been in um, Burger King or something like that. And man has come up to me and says, you want to buy United Kingdom Talk DVD? Two for £10. I'll give you two for £10. United Kingdom Talk DVD. It's happening all the time, dear. I'm telling you now. I am now an illegal drug. This programme is an illegal drug. And you see? You see, Maureen? You're addicted. You are addicted to me, aren't you? You're addicted to the show. The thing is, I'm going to be crafty like I suppose the drug dealers are. And what I'll do is for a while I'll give out the show free of charge, as it is now. And then eventually I'll start asking you to pay for it. And that's when people are going to get into problems. People, I can see people losing their houses just so that they can get their fix of United Kingdom talk. We'll probably start off with something that you won't notice, you know, a pound a show. And eventually we'll increase it until it's like a thousand pounds per show. And people, I, I can see it now, people will be selling houses. They will be so addicted. And probably what will happen is that the NHS, you know, like they do with the, um, what is that stuff they use instead of methadone, isn't it? The, the, I think that the, the, the National Health Service, when they have these people that are addicted to certain drugs, I'm not quite sure what, um, is it heroin? I think it's heroin. When they get people addicted to heroin, they try and wean them off with um, this stuff called methadone, I think it is. Right? Which I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Because then you hear people that are addicted to methadone, so I don't know what the difference is because I'm not a drug taker. But there we are. And I can see something similar happen. People go, will be going into clinics with an addiction to United Kingdom talk. And probably the NHS will try and wean them off my show by forcing them to listen to James Dean's matinee show. But of course it won't work because, I mean, it's, this show is just in a completely different class. Uh, James Dean uh, is the host of another podcast called The Matinee Show. You can find that at matineeshow.co.uk, matineeshow.co.uk. But, you know, I, I, I have a feeling also what will happen to this show is that old ones will probably be, be sold on eBay at some point or swapped by children in schools. You know, you know, you used to go to school and swap things like cards and stuff like that and, and, and autographs. And I wonder, you know, for one United Kingdom talk show, how many matineeshow.co.uk's would you have to have to swap for just one United Kingdom talk show? I don't think it would probably be possible. Probably be in its tens, you know, in, it, in its no, 200 matinee shows. I can, you can see them now, can't you? Kids in school. So please, please, can we have one of your United Kingdom talk shows? I'll swap it for 200 matinee shows. And the other kid was, no, not interested. That would be what they are try and wean you off this show if you're dependent on it by, by giving you matinee shows. But it won't work. In fact, I can see deaths because of this. I can actually see deaths and it's all very worrying. But for now, Maureen... You're okay. We're free. <laughs> how much? <laughs> how much do you think you should be charged? I don't know. I'd be no good at business, would I? I've no good at making them. Um, I'm not bothered about making money out of this at all. It would be nice one day to be paid, but there you go. You can't have everything. I've got a good paying job, so that's it. That's enough. Don't need to be rich. Um, Maureen wants to know. I'd like to know. How you managed to talk non-stop for nearly an hour and managed to make the most rubbishy, sh rubbishy subjects sound so interesting. I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> I think if I were to cover the same subjects with friends, they would haul me off to the funny farm. Ah, uh, yeah, well, I do well, that's another thing I expect to happen soon. I can't see them leaving me outside here with everyone else for much longer. I really can't. There will be one day where I'm, where I'm hauled off to the funny farm. It's got to happen, isn't it? She says, but it is lovely that you share your life with us. I feel privileged. We are strangers to you, but you have become a friend of ours. Yeah, well, don't be a stranger, Maureen. Tell us, uh, th this programme is not just about sharing what I do, but what you do as well. And this is indeed what you're doing with this email. 
And it's great when you get an email from someone saying, hello, you know, especially first time. Hello, my name's, I don't know, um, John. I'm in Canada. Um, been listening to your show for a while. Um, I am a, I cut down trees for a living. And there was a dangerous incident once when this happened and that. Do you see what I mean? It's all about sharing our stories. And often, certainly the regular people I talk about, for example, Joy and Acton, if I don't mention her for a while, people write in. And they ask how she is. And I tell them she's fine. She's all right. I, do, I usually ring Joy once, about once a week, once a week or so. And uh, she does. She goes up and down, you know. She's a little bit older than most of you. She's lovely. We love Joy. Um, my birthday is on the 19th of July. And if you could sing happy birthday to me, it would make my day. I shall do that. 19th of July. I just circle that. See, I've got to make a note of that. Otherwise, I forget. I did, um, I did set up this birthday alarm thing and I put people's birthdays in there. It didn't quite work out as well as I thought it would. It doesn't give you enough notice of when the birthday's going to come. I think it's about, it gives you about five days notice. And sometimes uh, the shows are recorded up to, I think it's eight days or eight or nine days in advance, as I mentioned uh, a couple of shows ago, all right? Um, and look, here she is there. Maureen says, how is Joy in Acton? If she's okay, I would appreciate a report from her how she's coping with a halogen oven. We have just bought one and would appreciate some tips from her. Well, I'll ask her. Um, I would get her on the phone, but while, when we do the shows in the garden, I don't have telephone equipment out here. It's all in the studio. So we'll have to wait till we go back into the studio for a little phone-in job, okay? Um, she says... Uh, She's going to have a moan here because uh, Maureen watches the show on YouTube and she says, I really don't like that dark curtain you are using. It blacks out a third of the screen. Bring back the Union Jack. Well, the thing there is, Maureen, recently I upgraded certain things to do with the show, including the camera. Um, the picture is good now. It, uh, I'm happy with how everything is looking and it's all in widescreen now and it, it uh, I'm reasonably happy with how it's looking. But the one disadvantage I've had of buying this, using this new camera is that the position of the old webcam that I was using was right in front of me and behind me was a map and everything else, wasn't it? You remember all that. Now, when I had the room decorated, uh, I took all that down and it was decorated and now we've got a clean wall there. And I had intended to put everything back up there. But on experimenting with the camera, the new camera, it would appear that when the camera is placed in that position, right, which is right in front of me, it is too close to me and I can't pull back any further. And that's the reason that it is now, when I'm in the studio, the camera is pointing the other way, kind of across the studio, and I've turned around, so you now see, when you're watching it, at least when I'm in the studio, all the equipment behind me flashing away and doing its stuff. It is, <laughs> all those flashing lights do actually do something, all right? Just let you, they're not just flashing lights, they, they are actually doing something. So that's why, um, that, now, um, where the camera is now, when I'm in the studio, there was a white door behind me, and I thought that looked awful. After watching a couple of the shots, I thought, oh, we've got to do something about that white door. And I had a black curtain, or a black piece of material, in the spare room, so I got that out, simply draped it across the door, and I thought that would cure the problem. But yes, you're quite right, now, the black curtain, I think, is doesn't look as good as I thought it would. So, I need to do something about that. Now, I could put the Union Jack back up over the black curtain. I think that I might do that next time. The other thing I was going to do was move the recording of the show into my spare room. Now, I have got a fairly large spare room, which again was decorated, I think, last year. And I could put the bed up on the wall and it, it could be literally just for recording the show and I think that would work quite well. I would 
put the black curtain up behind me again, but in front of the curtain I could there's room in there to have little shelving units and things where um, I, I could hang things up and that sort of thing. And I think that is the way I'd like to go at some point and get some proper lighting in there. It would be like a, almost like a mini TV studio. All right, so probably that's what I'm gonna do at some point. But you know how it is, these things do take time, especially when it's me concerned, dear. Although I have got a couple of Wednesdays off at the moment. Um, uh, the live show I do for someone, I'm taking a few Wednesdays off there uh, to catch up on a few bits and pieces. All right, Maureen? Um, here's a message from Robert the Viking in Iceland. Please could you ask Robert the Viking if he could send us an elf or perhaps know the websites where we can get one. Everyone, oh no, I think, oh no dear. Maureen, I think you've got the wrong end of the stick here, dear. These are not gifts, dear. Then, what, what does she go on to say here? Everyone around here has a dog or a cat for a pet, but we would rather have elves. The kind that come out at night and clean the pool, pool, clean the swimming pool and put the garden furniture away would be nice. No, no, no. You've got this all wrong, Maureen. Elves are not pets, dear. They are little living beings. That's terrible. Slavery elves are slaves. <gasps> Oh, Maureen, you, you're, you're going to upset the International Association of Elves. As I mentioned on a previous show, if you carry on like this, dear, you can't have elves as pets. They're not servants. I, I, can, I can see Robert at the moment absolutely horrified by what you've just mentioned. I really can. She goes on to say, a few housekeeping elves would be nice as well if they are not too expensive to feed. We don't have any slugs that they can munch. We have only snails, but the snails here tend to climb the trees in order to stay cool. <laughs> Do they really? <laughs> well, you know I've won the war against the snails this year, don't you? I've, I've not been affected by them at all. In... Over the last few years, I have had the most dreadful problem in this garden with snails and slugs. I mean, really overrun with the blooming things. But this year, um, from, the, from the time I saw the first slug, I started putting down the slug pellet things, and I haven't had the problem. They, they haven't come. I've obviously, I've, I've mass, I'm sorry to tell you this, and I ask for forgiveness from whatever your authority is, but I have mass murdered the snails this year. Sorry about that. But, you know, what do you do? It's either that or they eat everything. Anyway, I've won. I'm glad to say I've won. And uh, all my plants are growing really well. Really well. She says, I would be very grateful for your help and advice on the purchase of elves. Oh, and do we need to take them to vet when they are unwell? Because there is no National Elf Service in Spain. Yeah, very funny. National Elf Service. I love it. I love it. Well done. <laughs> Maureen. That's good. That is good. No, elves... Um, I must be on a quite, quite serious note here, Maureen. Elves are not pets, dear. They are not pets. They are not here to do tasks that you don't want to do. I mean, what's she saying here? Put the garden furniture away. Clean the pool, dear. Well, I, I can't help you with that one, but if you want them to wash up, can I suggest that you buy a dishwasher. I mean, I've got one. I don't use mine because it uses too much electricity. <laughs> I'm not joking. I am not I've got a lovely dishwasher in there that I bought two years ago. It doesn't get used. It never gets used because they use an enormous amount of electricity, your dishwasher, so don't use it anymore. Oh, come on, for God's sake. My sister's terrible with hers. On 24 hours a day, her dishwasher and a washing machine. My sister's oven's broken as well, isn't it? She's got a hole in the back of her oven. How does that happen? That's what I want to know. How on earth has my sister's oven got a hole in the back of it? I just don't get that. Can that happen? I've never had a hole. I've never known anyone tell me that they've got a hole in the back of their oven. Odd. Odd. She says, another request here. To the best of my knowledge, we've never seen you play the piano. 
I've just bought the cheapest Roland keyboard and would love to see you playing and giving beginners like me a few tips. It may also be interesting to hear about how you put your program together. All my love, hasta la vista from Maureen from Torre Vica in sunny Spain. Torre Vica. Oh, it sounds lovely there, Maureen. It really does. Um, putting the program together, well, it's, it's kind of an ongoing thing. Throughout the week, things happen, okay? And I have several bits of paper, one here, okay? There's one bit of paper here. Can you hear it? Right. I've got several bits of paper dotted around the house and uh, in my rucksack that I have my computer and I take to work. I've always got a bit of paper there. And if something happens that I think could be worth talking about, I write it down. Now, on this bit of paper in front of me, I have written down just, just one look, like one line. Sunglasses, Bracknell big day out, fit lads walking around with tops off, Tom Wright growing bags, moving into my first flat, tempted by a large screen telly, and, and strimmers that don't work, and other bits and pieces. Now, three of those you've heard about today already. Sunglasses, Bracknell Big Day Out, and Fit Lads Walking Around. I've crossed those out now, but the rest of them will come up on other shows, or sometimes I'll look again and I'll think, and let me see if there's anything down here. No, there's nothing here I, I, I will leave. Oh, yes. Uh, s films that you saw as a child at Christmas. Now, I've got that written down here, but now that I think about it, probably not the right time to do that. So I'll cross that out and we won't use that one. All right? What I was going to say, well, th that subject was going to be, um, do you remember the films that you saw on telly around Christmas time for the first time? And I could re really off a whole list of those. And... It's not just the film, but it's what's going on around you at the time. Sharing those Christmases, perhaps with your parents, or perhaps watching those films for the first time with your new children. You know, and, and, it's, and that's what I was going to talk about and I was going to invite you in, uh, 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 invite you to write in, or indeed email in, about the... Um, Oh, I've got itchy neck about the films that you saw at Christmas. And what do you remember going on around while that film was on? For example, uh, The Sound of Music. I remember watching that with my mum and dad and my sister. First time on British television, one Christmas. And um, I, I, I can see it as if it was yesterday. Like, the BBC One, one of the TV channels here, used to have the symbol of a globe turning round slowly. And I remember the announcer saying, and now for the first time on British television, Julie Andrews and Christopher Plummer star in The Sound of Music. And it was ten past three, I think, on the Christmas afternoon after the Queen's speech. And the globe faded into this picture of clouds and sky. And then the violin struck up, and there she come. The heels are alive with The Sound of Music. And it was just such a, a lovely, magical experience. Not just watching the film, but sharing it with a family. So I was going to invite you to talk about that. But then I thought, no, completely the wrong time of the year. So I crossed that out. So the biggest help I could give someone who was thinking about doing perhaps a show like this or trying to do it is, number one, just do it. Don't worry about what people think. Just go out and do it. And number two, biggest bit of help is to keep writing things down that you do. And write them down as soon as they happen. Because if you think in your head, I'll write that down later, I guarantee you will forget it. Okay? Great idea to have a notebook with you all the time, or indeed, uh, some of the mobile phones. Okay? They've all got little... Um, uh, recording devices, haven't they now? And you can kind of use it as a dictaphone, you know, where you say, uh, you, uh, you kind of push the button and say, okay, talk about how tall the sun, sunflowers are, and then record that. And then, but then, of course, when you get home, you've got to write all these things down. And, you know, you're better off to carry a little notepad, I think, and write down all the bits and pieces. And that's it, really. And then when I come out here, I have, I actually have in front of me, in the garden, a clock, right? 
which tells me um, when to finish the show, because this show is exactly 57 minutes long when it comes to the radio. The video shows are a little bit longer, only by about 30 seconds, because we've got film, a little film at the beginning and a little film at the end. The, the, the audio show is, is exactly 57 minutes long. Can't be any longer, can't be any shorter, because kindly radio stations do play this show out. And it has to be exactly that, that length. Literally, 50, not 57 minutes and one second, has to be 57 minutes long. So that's why the clock's there. And usually I record slightly under... All right. If you go slightly over, then it can be hard to bring it back down to size, bring it back down to 57 minutes. What you then have to do is look through it and, and cut out little bits of silence, or maybe um, a part of the show if you've gone way over the top. If, if you go slightly under, you can fill up the end with a bit of music. You know I play a bit of music at the end, my, my kind of theme music, right? You'll notice sometimes it's short, sometimes it's long. It depends how long I need to put the music on to make it up to 57 minutes. So that's the reason for that. And I think that's it, really. Um, I record the show sometimes direct onto the computer or, if we're outside, onto my little recording device I have here sitting next to me. Um, I did try one of those tie clip microphones on a previous show. I wasn't happy with the quality of that, and I'm going to buy... A high quality one. Uh, not yet, I can't afford it at the moment, so I'm just saving up a bit of money for one of those and I'll buy one of those and that will probably improve things and you won't have this thing uh, sitting next to me like this because I think it looks ugly to be honest. And um, of course the video side of things, the video is recorded on a camera. Now the sound is not recorded on the camera. The sound is recorded on here. The video is recorded on a proper video camera. It's a Canon. Technically, pe uh, technical people might want to know it's a Canon Legria FS200. That's the camera I use. And then when I finish the show, which today isn't about, I've only got another five minutes or so to go. When I finish the show, I then take the, uh, switch off the camera and the audio thing. I take the audio thing first and I make the radio show. I put it together, um, add the music to it, save it, and then upload it to the relevant service or radio stations. And when I've done that, I then load the... I have a separate computer to work the video things. I then load the video into the computer and the audio, which I've already recorded, and then I synchronise it so that when I talk, my lips move at the same time, and then I save that, add titles, add the film at the beginning and the end, then save that, and then I upload that as well. So it's, it's a reasonably long process. It, it doesn't actually take long to record and upload the radio show. All in all, I suppose about an hour and 25 minutes to do an hour show. With a video show, slightly different, it does take longer. It takes about an hour and... 30 minutes, I suppose, to... I oh, know, not as long as that, perhaps. No, actually, no, I'm lying. The audio show is about an hour and 20 minutes. The video show, about an hour and 30 minutes to put it together, OK? But uh, the computer then takes about two hours to save it and mix it together and everything. I, I don't know what... I mean, you just literally push a button and then you leave it. OK, so I don't have to sit there for two hours then. I, I, so that's all in all, I suppose, the video side of it takes about, about three and a half hours to do a one-hour show. And uh, technical people might want to know the software I now use to put the video show together is Adobe Audition Elements, which I found relatively easy to use and relatively inexpensive at about £85. And I've been very, very pleased with that piece of software, because I'm not the best person to learn new software at all. I get, I get very frustrated with it, um, but it, it may well be I found it so easy because I had to use it. <clears throat> with the camera, it, it took me quite a few weeks to, 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 to work out the settings that I needed to use, but uh, I think we're there now. All right, so hope that, uh, hope that uh, uh, informs you there. Um, Maureen, as for piano playing, I'll try and do some on the next show, all right? Or, or the one after, as you request it. Um, I'm very much into religious music. I like church hymns. 
and uh, especially the Latin thing. And funnily enough, uh, so I, I might play you, a, a, I don't know, a couple of hymns or perhaps something Latin. There, there's a long Latin Catholic thing called the Credo, which I love immensely. I, I might give you a little play of that, all right? Um, but I, I'm fortunate to have a lovely piano come organ in my living room that I've had for about eight years now. I bought that with the money that I earned from New Year's Eve 2000, where all the DJs were on, no, 1999 into 2000, where all the DJs and artists were on an awful lot of money. It's only that one night ever, you know, once in a lifetime, we were on a lot of money. And with mine, I bought the piano, and it's um, lovely to just sit there sometimes late at night and tinkle away, you know. So I'll do that for you. We'll, we'll, we'll do a couple of hymns. And talking, talking of um, uh, Latin masses, I actually went on, because this is something that's dying out, going to a Catholic Latin Mass. And I went on the internet the other day and I found one, or I believe I found one, which is actually not too far away from me in Reading. And I might go there Sunday because I do miss singing the Catholic Mass. And I might actually go there Sunday and um, uh, uh, enjoy that, okay? Thanks for that, Maureen. Um, Oh, we're nearly out of time. Just one for one more quick email today, uh, which comes from Doug. She, he says, third, three ti third time's the charm. Look at them sexy legs. Yeah, I've got my leg. I've had my legs out the last few shows. Those of you watching, I've got shorts on, so we, we've got our legs out. <laughs> He says, one of my favourite episodes of The Wartons was when Jim Bob Wharton built a TV set. Oh, I'm going to have to look for that one. And he also sends a link for a site called squarefootgardening.com. So have a look at that, squarefootgardening.com if you've only got a small garden. Right, that's it from me. Uh, the email address, once again, if you ever want to join in, and it's lovely to hear from you, is chris at unitedkingdomtalk.co.uk. Chris at unitedkingdomtalk.co.uk. I'll see you on the next show. Myself, Chris Redden. Thanks for watching and listening. Bye-bye.